see she is 35 years old residing from chandaka bhubaneswar she is hindu and housewife in by occupation and according to modified kuppuswami classification she is of lower middle class her date of admission was on 13th april her chief complaint was that she had missed her period and she complained of severe pain in the lower abdomen on the left side which was associated with bleed per vagina since two days she had a history of upd positive eight days back following which she had taken an ntp kit seven days back from a pharmacy her history of presenting illness the patient was apparently well eight days back when she found out she was pregnant following which she had taken an ntp kit which the uh, following which she developed pain which was present in the lower abdomen more on the left side and bleeding per vagina the pain was sudden and onset acute in nature in the left lower abdomen which was sharp in character and non irritating the patient was referred from outside hospital and reached our casual casualty at 130 pm with foley's catheter and central iv line in c2 the foley's uh, the eurobag had 60 ml of high colored urine in the eurobag See, these are all examination findings, right? Why you are mentioning this in history of present illness? Did the patient tell you everything? Did you ask the patient about this? History of present ma illness is just elaboration of your chief complaints. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she had uh, come with the. Uh, Who gave the history? Patient is conscious and coherent. Has she given the history? Ma'am, uh, she her vitals were not stable, but she was conscious. Yeah, yeah. So uh, does she gave history that I have taken this pills and all? The ma'am, uh, she had come. Uh, she had come with a paper which showed that uh, she yeah. had all consumed. Okay, but still, has she given the history that I have been uh, so on so and I, have, I mean, like I was put on central line and all. So all this will come under treatment history, or else you can put it in some past treatment history also. But this won't fit into this history of present illness, I guess. This is what the treatment. She. This is about the treatment she took already, right? Yes, ma'am. She presented here in the casualty with the the following treatment already taken out. Sir. Yeah. No. See, what is history of present illness? You tell me. What What do you want to highlight in history of present illness? What is the main logic behind history of present illness? Um, ma'am, to elaborate the chief complaint which she had. Yeah. Uh, okay, chief complaint. Chief complaint is a major complaint which is uh, given by a patient. and it has to be in patient words okay and it has to be in chronological order what has started first and then what has uh, lead to what or led to what okay and now what do you take in history of present illness we'll elaborate uh, the the three points which she had come with we'll elaborate on them yeah yeah will you take will you write the treatment history all what has uh, what has she undergone everything there in history of present illness I'm um, shifted to the treatment history. Yeah, yeah. You better put it in a uh, treatment history. Okay, it won't fit into history of present illness. Is what I feel. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and nobody will uh, give you uh, uh, information about the drugs that they have given this. They have given this and all. Of course, it is there in the uh, prescription. You better uh, mention it separately. Okay. Nobody will tell you about this. Okay. Yes. No patient will know the drugs and all. Okay. Um, should I say it here or should I say it later? Yeah, uh, it's okay. You just carry on for now. That's fine. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she had already received one point of ringolactate and one point of normal saline, which was given rapid. Uh, injection: tramadol, hundred mg, hundred ml NS, and noradrenaline at the rate of ten ml per hour, which was started at twelve forty pm. Okay. Uh, and uh, if a report was also with her, which showed that the uterus was of normal size with empty cavity, uh, the bilateral ovaries were normal, but uh, there was mindless cystic seen, which showed free fluid in the Morrison pouch, renal pouch, and the pouch of duct. So okay, so you have seen her EFAST report. Okay, what do you infer from this? Um, uh, what, that, you, what does it infer? Ma'am, considering the history of the patient, uh, which she complained uh, of her missed period and pain per abdomen more on the left side, and free fluid uh, in this uh, in the pouch of Douglas Pino in the pouch and Morrison pouch, it shows that the patient might have an ectopic pregnancy with the ruptured ectopic, following which the uh, blood the uh, following which she has chemoperidone. 
yeah so okay if you find only free fluid in pod what do you uh, what do you think it could be uh, see uh, see forget about her history i have this findings of efast report okay uterus is normal size ovaries are normal and mild ascites is seen so okay. there is no such thing called uh, there is no such thing about the ectopic thing here in this scan okay so ectopic mass has not been mentioned in the scan right so what do you think of the uh, ultrasound um ma'am it can be because of liver causes as well liver causes and you just go from the gynecological causes uh, ma'am it can be pelvic inflammatory disease yes yes and it might be an acute pid okay where patient has severe pain abdomen and all okay because generally free fluid without any other sac uh, other gestational sac can fit into pid also okay okay but still you have to clinically correlate each and every report you give uh, you uh, see okay so when you clinically correlate the patient patient is having severe pain abdomen and patient is not hemodynamically stable the yes, patient you got is still on noradrenaline to maintain heart rate right that means she is not he uh, hemodynamically stable so with this report and uh, when you clinical correlate uh, correlate uh, clinically correlate this report then what do you uh, uh, what does it infer i mean what do you think of the case going to more to was like topic pregnancy because yeah. uh, because how she the patient is not stable and there and she has a history of missed period as well yeah what ectopic it could be So from tubal ectopic. So you are sure that it would be tubal tubal for all? I mean, um, tubal. No, uh, the most common uh, ectopic is a tubal ectopic, following which. Uh, How common is tubal ectopic compared to other ectopics? Um, ma'am, seventy percent is ampullary, twelve percent is uh, uh, isthmus. No, I am asking how common is tubal ectopic among all the ectopics. so if you take like or if you uh, calculate uh, ectopics for 100 including tubal including abdominal including ovarian cervical and all how common is tubal ectopic uh, 9, 95 percent, 96% yes very good so if you if you suspect ectopic your first suspicion should be always tubal ectopic okay in a very rare case, case scenarios it could be an abdominal or it could be a cervical cervical will not present in this way anyways or it could be any ovarian ectopic okay yeah okay next a menstrual history mm -hmm. menstrual cycles uh, the previously menstrual cycles were regular she had her periods for 3 to 4 days in a 28 to 30 day cycle she had a normal flow in which she used 2 to 3 packs per day there was no dysmenorrhea uh, and her last menstrual period was on 11th of march and there's no uh, no passage no history of passage of clots Okay, so how many weeks of gestation was she? She was a uh, four weeks five days. Okay, yeah. Her obstetric history. She was married for twelve years. It was a non-consanguineous marriage. In her first pregnancy, uh, she had a six-year-old female child, which was uh, a term birth. The weight was two point eight kg. Uh, for LSCS, the indication was fetal distress. Following which, the baby cried. immediately after birth and was breastfed for uh, within half an hour of delivery with no pre lactation feeds given there was no antenatal or postnatal complications in this pregnancy and the child is immunized till date uh, the child is alive healthy and without any developmental milestone defect in the second pregnancy uh, she had a 3 year old male child term birth the birth weight was 3.1 kg uh, cesarean was done uh, she was told uh, that uh, because of previous cesarean Uh, she she had to do cesarean this time. That's what the patient's words were. And uh, the baby cried immediately after birth. Breastfed within half an hour of delivery with no pre-lactation feeds given. Uh, no antenatal or postnatal complications in this pregnancy. The child is immunized till date. Child is alive, healthy, without any developmental milestone. Okay, so you have an ectopic patient, and uh, what I mean, like, what do you concentrate more in this obstetric history and uh, contraceptive history? Uh, we will ask the patient that uh, is on any uh, contraceptive currently or not, and uh, if the patient is on contraceptive, the most common one are the intrauterine contraceptives, uh, which implantations which are given, following which the chances of ectopic pregnancy can be more. Following, I mean, what is the contraceptive intrauterine? 
yeah if you take if you take the figures intrauterine contrac i mean like whatever intrauterine device it could be may it be lng or may it be normal copper device the chances of ectopic with intrauterine device is less why because the effectiveness of the contraception is good okay so as such the pregnancy will not happen and the risk of ectopic will also come down and when you go for lng iucd i mean it was lng iud it is much more effective okay so the pregnancy chances itself are itself is less and a risk of ectopic is also less okay so the most important contraception which can cause ectopic is progesterone only pills okay so it may be an implantable progesterone only pill or a, a progesterone only contraceptive or may be oral pill or could it could be a depot okay whatever it is progesterone only pill contraception has highest risk of ectopic okay why if there is a previous history of usage not the present history if there is present if she is presently on contraception as such the chance for pregnancy itself is less okay yeah. so if she is on iucd and if she is on lng iud then the risk of pregnancy is less and sorry the risk of uh, uh, contraception failure is less and the risk of ectopic is also less but if she has history of uses of pops then the chance of ectopic could be high why yeah progesterone actually can decrease tubal motility okay so because of decreased tubal motility the tubal function can be affected and the risk of ectopic can be more okay so that's the reason to uh, progesterone pills has increased risk of ectopic okay Uh, the third pregnancy is the current pregnancy, which was spontaneous, which was spontaneous conception detected eight days back by urine pregnancy test, following which she had taken empty pickets seven days. Yeah. Uh, contraceptive history: there was history of, of usage of condoms. She has not used any hormonal contraception. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Her personal history: the uh, she had a regular bowel and bladder. Normal sleep wake cycle with a mixed Indian diet. She had a good appetite and no history of substance abuse. Okay. Uh, there was no significant medical or surgical history. There was no. So, what is the significant medical and surgical history relevant to ectopic pregnancy? Um, what do you feel is most important to rule out? Ma'am, uh, if there is any history of pelvic inflammatory disease or any previous history of tubal ectopic, it will increase the chances this time. Okay, and um, ma'am, there is if there is any history of uh, abdominal surgery following uh, which uh, what, ab okay. what abdominal surgeries do you think are more important? Appendectomy. Appendectomy. Yes, particularly if there is any ruptured appendix and all, there could be a risk of adhesion. And also, the risk of ectopic will be more. Okay, so uh, we'll. Uh, I mean, how about PID causing ectopic? So you all know that. I mean, like it's an evident thing, right? If there is any risk of, I mean, like if there is any past history of PID, the risk of ectopic will be more. How much? I mean, how much is the risk with one episode of PID? One episode, ma'am. Uh, uh, Thirty percent. What is the normal risk of uh, ectopic pregnancy in a normal, uh, I mean, like uh, in normal lady, in normal low risk women? What is the percentage? What is the percentage of ectopic pregnancy? Um, yeah, it's hardly 0.5 to 1%. Point five, not even 0.5, it's hardly 0.2 to 1%. Okay. And if there is any previous history of ectopic, that has the highest risk. So if the patient is having any previous history of ectopic, she has a 10% increased risk of having next ectopic. Okay. And if patient had an uh, had a single episode of PID, then the risk will increase to obviously 9%. Okay. And if what are the other risks risk factors for ectopic pregnancy? In history of genital TB can lead to genital TB as such is like see, uh, if genital. there is the PID. Uh, then the risk of, I mean, let's see, the risk of infertility is not very high with PID when compared to TB. 
TB as such, if if the patient is having TB, tubes will be tot tubes will be totally damaged, and the uh, chance of having pregnancy as such is decreased. So the risk of ectopic in TB will be there, but uh, risk. I mean, like because of the increased chance of infertility, the number of ectopics in TB is less. You understood the point. If it is a if it is a normal, I am in PID. Tubal damage could be there, and the risk of ectopic could be there, obviously. But if it is a PID, obviously, oh, sorry, if it is a TB, obviously the tubes will be damaged totally. Okay, so as such, patient will suffer from infertility rather than having ectopic pregnancy. Okay. A man with history of smoking uh, can lead to can affect the C of the tubing. And what else? Um. PID. Sterilization reversal. Yes, so any tubal surgery, how much is the risk of uh, ectopic? Uh, so if the patient has any previous tubal surgery or sterilization reversal, the risk of ectopic could be somewhere uh, around 3 to 4 percent is the minimal range, but it can vary up to 30 percent in few studies. Okay, but when compared to the normal population, the risk of ectopic is more with tubal surgery, right? Yes. Maybe sterilization reversal or maybe some surgery for a tubal pathology and all. Okay, so, uh, okay, okay, we'll discuss that later. Yeah, carry on. If there's no significant family history. Mm -hmm. Uh, general physical examination, the patient was conscious, alert, and oriented to time, place, and person. She was moderately built and nourished. She had uh, BMI was 25. Hello. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes, ma'am, you are audible, but something issue from Dr. Sriya. Yeah, yeah. Can you please check it? Yeah, um, just. Sorry, Dr. Shreya, we have lost the connection, I think. Can you please repeat the general physical examination? Um, Ma'am, the patient was conscious, alert, and oriented to time, place, and person. She was moderately built and nourished. Her BMI was 25.6 uh, kg per meter square. Pallor was present. There was no ictrus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. Her pulse was 120 beats per minute, and her blood pressure was 80 by 64 on yeah. arterial. So, just uh, briefly tell me what is the significance of each and every point you have uh, noted here. Um, the patient was conscious, alert, and oriented mm -hmm. place in person, which shows uh, that the pa uh, that the patient. Uh, if the patient would have been uh, crashing, the patient would have, have been. If caught. the patient is in hemodynamic shock, she would have not been conscious and coherent actually. Okay, so patient is hemodynamically unstable, but she has not gone into shock. Yes. Um, yeah. Next. Um, uh, we will talk about the built and nourishment of the patient, whether the patient was previously anemic or if the, if the patient is very lean, then it okay. will adversely affect the outcome of. Uh, the, if the surgery is done or any procedure. If the patient is obese, the, the procedure could be difficult and all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Next, what is the role of BMI? Ma'am, uh, well, ma uh, if the patient uh, is very lean or obese, again, uh, the is, if the patient is very lean, poorly nourished, then the recovery from the procedure will be will be very slow if the yeah, patient particularly particularly in relation to uh, your ectopic pregnancy not in this case but generally if you have to give any medical me management with methotrexate your bmi weight everything is important right you have to add body surface area here also okay yeah, yeah. next uh, ma'am pallor was present which showed that the patient was bleeding inside uh, already we had seen in the EFA scan that what is the importance of pulse and bp in this patient uh, ma'am it shows that the patient is not hemodynamically stable currently because the, the so vital signs are the good indicators actually okay you have to tell patient is hemodynamically stable or not based on your pulse rate and bp so when you feel the pulse you have to Along with the rate, you have to feel the volume also. 
okay because volume is also equally important here okay and pp always will tell you whether she is having uh, i mean like any bleeding or not okay yeah okay then fine next a uh, systemic examination on respiratory system by that is normal with pillow bed sounds were heard there were no added sounds the cbs system uh, s1 s2 was heard but no added murmurs and in cns there was no focal neurological deficit Yes, please. Next slide. Upper uh, abdomen examination on inspection. Uh, abdomen appeared slightly distended. And the previous LSCS scar appeared healthy. On palpation, tenderness was present in the left iliac portion region. Uh, there was no palpable or demomegaly. On an percussion, the nose was tympanic. Auscultation, the uh, vowel sound was. Yeah. So, what are the differential diagnoses for uh, left iliac portion tenderness? um now it can be a, 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 it can be bubble causes or it can be the tubal causes in bubble it can be a uh, uh, colitis okay good yes ma'am and perception and the uh, spleen which is coming down which can lead to pain mm -hmm. and uh, ma'am kidney causes can also cause it spleen will not spleen will not show in the iliac region right ओके on per vagina examination the uterus size could not be elicited the left cornix was full and striatal motion tenderness was present yeah okay so you if you are for suppose if you are working in a uh, periphery where you don't have any source i mean any scan machine or any chance to get a scan so uh, in this case scenario how will you proceed ma'am first what, what extra examination you can do here uh ma'am we can uh, um, uh, see uh if you are not i mean like if you are not very sure about the scan or if you are, if you don't have any uh, i mean ultrasound examination i mean i mean if you can't do any ultrasound examination and all just put a needle into your pod okay just two small caldocentesis or you just aspirate free fluid from uh, pod if you are very exp i mean like if but at the same time you have to be cautious enough but still if you just aspirate the fluid fluid from uh, pod that is like caldocentesis obviously you can see blood that yes, means blood. she is bleeding see pre in previous days when they have uh, when they had no ultrasound and all they used to just aspirate blood from the P, i mean aspirate things from the pod and if there is uh, blood in uh, pod aspirate obviously they would take for immediate surgery okay that itself is a clear indication that she is having ectopic okay yes yeah this actually in now i mean in recent scenarios and in present scenarios this is not uh, i mean like possible because we have our own, own ultrasound and all but in case in case if you are in remote areas working with no ultrasound this could be a better diagnostic test okay provisional diagnosis was made of ruptured left tibia and uh, okay Investigations were sent immediately, in which the hemoglobin was less, it was seven point seven. Ah, uh, the WBC count was a little increased, twelve thousand two hundred seventy, and on rest, all the parameters were within normal limits. Okay, please next slide. Uh, Ma'am, uh, on management, laparotomy was done, in uh, which left side appendectomy done, and right sided tubal ligation was done. Ah, uh, because of the a uh, patient requested the tubal ligation intraoperatively a hemoperitoneum was seen ruptured ectopic pregnancy was seen with bleeding continuing from the ruptured tube left side is albuginectomy was done and the specimen was sent for histopathology right tubal ligation was done because as per requested by the patient bilateral ovaries appeared healthy and were preserved and about 1700 ml of blood and around 1 liter of clots were removed and hemostasis was secured 
Okay. Suppose, uh, okay, you, I mean, you are very aware that she is having ectopic, you have reserved the blood and all. When will you start giving blood in ectopic pregnancy? Ma'am, we gave the blood uh, intraoperatively. Intraoperatively, at what time will you start? Ma'am, intraoperatively. So, so there is no point of starting blood even if you don't ligate the bleeder, right? Okay. So, unless until you identify the bleed. For support, I mean, even before that, you can resuscitate the patient. You have to resuscitate. There is no other option. But once you ligate the bleeder, once you find the place and you ligate, then you can start bleed, I mean, blood. Okay. So what have you done for the patient? Salpingectomy. So what are the other options you have here? Currently, the patient was not hemodynamically stable and it was a ruptured ectopic. So so, uh, regarding the surgical management only. Uh, can you do any salping ostomy in this patient? No. no why? Not. Yeah, why? Because the patient is uh, all, already at the right Okay. Okay, fine. So, in which cases you want to do salping ostomy? Uh, Ma'am, in which in unruptured cases, the patient is hemodynamically stable. We can go for salping uh, salping ostomy or salping ostomy. Yeah, for that salping ostomy or salping ostomy also, the sac size should be less. It should be less than three centimeters. And it should be better it uh, a, a better prognosis if it is located in the distal part of the tube. Okay. Yeah. So you have done salping ostomy or salping ostomy, whatever it is. Then what could be the extra risk for that? There can be increased uh, risk of future ectopic pregnancy. Of course. There can be, uh, uh, she can come with infertility also. So. Okay, good. And the risk of persistent, uh, uh, I mean, trophoblast, I mean, like not molar. The, I mean, we, we may not completely evacuate the gestational, I mean, like products of conception. Okay. So there could be some left out persistent trophoblastic tissue also. Okay. That also could be a possibility. So in whom do you prefer salping ostomy is what I discussed already. So what is the main aim of doing salping ostomy or salping ostomy? Um, preserve the tube of that side as well. To preserve tubal fertility. Unless until you don't have that indication, there is no point of doing salping ostomy or salping water. Okay, fine. So, uh, if the patient, uh, okay, had the patient been hemodynamically stable and all, what are the options you have? What are the other options you have? We could have gone for laparoscopy if the patient was hemodynamically stable. But okay. we would have gone for a salpingectomy only in this case because the tubes were, the tube was already ruptured. Okay, okay, fine. And her family is also complete. She doesn't want this pregnancy as such. So there is no point of saving the tube. Okay, yeah, next. Four pins of uh, fresh frozen plasma and one pin of PRBC was given intraoperatively. Why so only I four, uh, one PRBC and one uh, four pints of FFP? To keep so the, what is the ratio between PRBC and FFP generally? One is two or three. Yeah, depends. Depends on your own hospital protocol. But why is it uh, in reverse here? Why four FFPs and one PRBC? Ma'am, in, immediately fresh frozen plasma was available. So we had given her uh, immediately fresh frozen plasma. And as and when uh, we got the blood, we had given yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, intraperitoneal intra drain was given, the abdomen was closed in layers and the skin was closed with a pylon as mattress. So, so, yeah, next day you have done HP, right? So what is the importance of that HP and what is the difference between doing HP and PCV? Um, uh, next day we had done hemoglobin uh, so that we can know the status of the uh, patient if she needs any more blood, if she requires yeah. any more is it a Is it a reliable marker, HP? Uh, Why? I'm not sure. Yeah, so intraoperatively, even if you do LSCS also, uh, Generally, what happens in surgery, there will be a significant amount of blood loss. And here the patient is already hemodynamically uh, unstable. Okay. So that means she has she has bled a lot. Okay. That means there could be hemo hemoconcentration. So if you if you have hemoconcentration, obviously your HP will be high. So you can't rely on that HP. Okay. The most reliable marker here is PCV, that is your hematocrit. Hematocrit could have given you a better uh, this thing picture than 
HB. Okay. So generally, postoperatively, hematocrit is a better and reliable marker than HB. Okay. Yes, sir. Because of the hemo concentration. Okay. Yes. Vitals were stable next day. Uh, the post op period was uneventful, and the patient was discharged on post op day seven after suture removal with hemoglobin of 9.2 gram per day. Next, that's it. Yeah. Another discussion part. Yes. Yeah. So you've already written what is the most common site. Why is it most common site? Um, the most common site of fertilization in the fallopian tube is ampulla. Uh, therefore, the most common site is ectopic, for ectopic. Okay. What is the fate of tubal ectopic? Uh, Ma'am, there are mainly three fates. Uh, the first one is uh, to, uh, is it abortion, tubal abortion, which is more common on the distal, if the implantation is the distal part of the tube. Uh, the second one is uh, when there is ectopic pregnancy and it will continue until uh, the tubes are ruptured. Uh, and third is when it itself uh, gets, uh, with time, it, it itself uh, gets resolved. Resolved. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. So uh, next, how do you man? And what are the indications for doing medical management in tube? I mean, in tubal ectopic. Ma'am, uh, if the size of the sac is less than four centimeter, and preferably the cardiac activity is absent, uh, and the beta HCG is less than five thousand. Okay. So what if the patient, I mean, and the sac's diameter is less than three to four centimeters also. Okay. Okay. And patient should be hemodynamically stable. That's the major of this thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, I mean, for suppose if I have a patient who is totally hemodynamically stable and uh, uh, her sac size is less than three centimeters, cardiac activity not there, but still beta HCG is 10,000. So do you want to give it a try or not? I'll go for the surgical. I'll go for laparoscopy for that patient. Right. But the patient is very adamant and wants medical management only. What will you explain? We will explain that there is increased risk of if we give methotrexate, it can adversely affect also that uh, in the tube and it can itself lead to rupture. Yeah. See, the thing is, beta HCG actually, uh, I mean, if it is less than 1000, then the chances of uh, chances of success for the medical management is more, okay? And if the beta HCG is more than 5,000 or more, or is if it is like 10,000 or all, the chances of success for medical management is less. Even then you can give it try, okay? It's not that, it's not an absolute contraindication, okay? You have to explain uh, to the patient that the chances of success for medical management is less, but you should never say no just because beta HCG is high, okay? Yeah. Okay, fine. What is the mechanism of action? Um, so what is methotrexate? Um, it acts, uh, it is an anti-metabolic uh, and it's an anti-metabolic. It acts on the uh, if it acts on the uh, it, it prevents synthesis of, synthesis of nucleic acids. So it is anti-neoplastic drug. Okay. Okay, fine. So what are the prerequisites before medical management? What are the things you have to see in the patient? And what are the investigations you order? And how will you proceed? Um, uh, we go for the basic investigations, but for with uh, while giving the methotrexate, we make sure that we also give leucovarin to the patient. So, you will give leucovarin in all kinds of method in all uh, regimens of methotrexate. No, uh, the two regimens. What are the regimens? What are the medical management regimens you have? Um, two mainly uh, for methotrexate. One is a single dose, and another is a serial dosing of uh, methotrexate. Multiple dose, yeah. Multiple. So you, you decided to give single dose regimen. So what are the investigations you order before giving uh, single, dose uh, single dose regimen? Uh, check for the, we go for CBC, we check the WBC counts. Why? 
So you just tell me what are the investigations you want to do and what is the significance of that investigation and how will you start and give the treatment? Now, uh, we give uh, 15 milligram per meter square of metotrexate according to the body surface area. Uh, we first check the beta HCG levels of the yes. patient. Yes. Zero, on day zero. Then we'll is it day zero? Is it day zero? Day, day, day one. Day one, yes. There is no day zero in methotrexate regimen, okay? The day you start methotrexate is counted as day one, okay? And before giving methotrexate, you have to check HCG because yes. that's what is an indicator, right, for follow-up yes. and all. The follow -up. And, yeah. And next, you have to do a mandatory ultrasound to know the size of the sac and to know whether cardiac activity is there or not. And, I mean... Because of infertility and IVF conceptions, the chance of heterotopic pregnancy could be there or the chance of multiple pregnancies could be there. So it is always better to do a, a, a ultrasound before. And you have to check her blood group. Why? If she's RH negative, you have to give her anti-D, right? And CBC should be checked and LFT, RFT should also be checked. Why? Because methotrexate is hepatotoxic and also I mean um, toxic to kidney also. And what else? Okay, okay. Then fine, you have checked everything. She is fit for uh, methotrexate. So how will you give single dose regimen? Um, Ma'am, on day one, after doing the beta HCG level, we'll first give uh, 50 milli according to the body surface area, 50 milligram per meter square. Following which we'll again do a beta HCG level on day four. If the beta okay. level has fallen by more than 15%, that means the treatment is working and we'll, continue, we'll again take a uh, beta HCG le uh, level on day seven. If it's again more than 15% fall, then, uh, yeah. we, then the treatment has been successful. This is the most common misinterpretation. Okay, what you have to do? You have to do beta HCG on day one. That beta HCG will just tell you whether she's fit for uh, medical treatment or what is the success of uh, medical treatment. You cannot compare the fall of beta HCG with day one. You have to do day four beta HCG and again do day seven beta HCG and the uh, fall should be between day four and day seven, not between day one and day four. Okay. So you have to do day four beta HCG, do again day seven beta HCG, check whether the beta HCG fall is more than 50% between fourth and seventh day, not between the first and fourth day or first and seventh day. Okay. So on seventh day, you do day four beta HCG, but you have to compare the fall again on day seven. Okay, not on day four. Okay, day seven, you do beta HCG again. You check whether there is fall of 15% compared to the day four value. And if the fall is more than 50%, 15%, then okay, the medical management what you've given has been successful. And you need to follow up with beta HCG every weekly till it becomes nil. Okay. What if there is no fall? What if the management is not uh, successful? We'll again give um... Hello. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, we'll again give method Sorry, method. I missed you. Ma'am, if, if, the, if there is no fall in beta HCG, we'll again uh, check the beta HCG level on that day, again giving methotrex state, and that will become our new day one. We can do this cycle for uh, for three more times. Uh, total three times we can do this yeah. cycle. Maximum maximum three doses can be given in a uh, weekly interval. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what, what is the other, do other dosage regimen you know? Multiple doses regimen. How do you give that? And what is the dose by that? From that, uh, me, along with methotrexate, we will be giving uh, leucovorin also. What is the dose uh, of methotrexate in multiple dose regimen? 0.1 milligram per kg. 1 mg per kg. Okay. Leucovorin is 0.1, methotrexate is 1 mg per kg. Okay. And uh, okay. And on what, what days you give methotrexate, what days you give leucovorin? Um, now we will give on a uh, one three five seven uh, method exit and a uh, four two uh, four to six eight. So the day after method exit should be followed by leucovirin. Okay, and you should make sure that patient is not on oral folic acid. Okay. Patient should be only given IM or leucovirin. That's it. Okay. So okay. So when will you do beta HCG for her again? On day uh, day seven we will do the beta HCG. Again, the same. 
whenever you give uh, methotrexate you whenever you give methotrexate on the days of methotrexate you can check here you can do a day 3 beta hcg and you can check the fall between day 1 and day 3 also okay you understood so day 4 beta hcg in single dose regimen is of i mean like not to uh, not to compare with the day 1 but here day 3 beta hcg you can compare it with day 1 and you can check whether the other dose is needed or not okay so you need not go keep on giving all the four doses and all you can check beta hcg see the fall if the fall is there then you need not uh, give the again uh, you need not give again methotrexate okay you can skip the next dose okay and you can weekly follow up the uh, beta hcg values you got my point yeah so which which regimen is better single dose or uh, multiple dose regimens one uh, single dose is better uh, because sometimes the patient is better if it's a single dose methotrexate compared to the patient and and the adverse effects adverse effects of methotrexate are better with single dose so will there be any uh, side effects in the future pregnancy if the patient has used methotrexate in this uh, cycle and once uh, the patient is ectopic there will be future risk from effect of methotrexate no i am asking about the effect of methotrexate in next pregnancy is it it is teratogenic right yes ma'am it is but uh, it effect her pregnancy in uh, for, uh, future no ma'am yeah no the body i mean the drug would have been excreted by the time and there won't be any teratogenic effect or residual effect on the pregnancy okay okay uh, so what else we have discussed medical management we have discussed surgical management okay uh what are the other ectopic pregnancies you know um if uh, other than a uh, fallopian tube there can be ovarian uh, ectopic pregnancy there can be in the abdomen and can be survive ectopic pregnancy so also now we have to include scar ectopic also cesarean scar ectopic pregnancy could be there okay yeah so how do you manage a case of cervical uh, ectopic pregnancy Um, uh, first we have to rule out whether it is uh, in the cause of the early pregnancy and it can be a lower implantation so we have to separate the cervical uh, pregnancy from a uterine ex- pregnancy mm-hmm. first we will do that uh, major uh, i mean like major challenge you face while you are doing uh, while you are managing cervical pregnancy so right now it it has torrential bleeding uh, risk okay so there could be a torrential bleed while uh, managing the cervical pregnancy okay so the first option here could be again medical management that would be a better option here if not if you try to evacuate you better do uterine artery ligation and if if the bleeding is not uh, uh, if the bleeding is not we are not able to control bleeding means you have to go for hysterectomy okay yeah uh, so because uh, you have to sort out for a radical management in cervical pregnancy i mean cervical pregnancy so that is the bad ectopic to have actually okay even though patient may be hemodynamically stable in all the cases unless until you intervene there won't be any hemodynamical instability to the patient okay so as such patient may be patient will be hemodynamically stable but still the prognosis of cervical pregnancy in mean in terms of treatment could be radical there i mean there could be a chance that patient has to resort for hysterectomy okay so yeah uh, how do you yeah how do you diagnose ectopic pregnancy in ultrasound um, uh, first uh, will Uh, the uterus will be of normal size the et lining will be within uh, it can be within normal limits and the most important is the uterine cavity would be empty at that time there can be a presence of uh, a pseudo gestational sac but uh, mostly the uterus would be empty and when we will check for the we look uh, we put the probe on the adnexa the uh, either as a tra- adnexal mass will be seen or sometimes uh, the cardiac activity of the ectopic pregnancy could also be present so what is the percentage uh, what is the chance that you can see a gestational sac in the tube so what is the percentage uh, where you can see a hyperechoic ring or the ring in i mean uh, uh, ring of fire appearance and what is the chance there could be uh, nothing at all 
so in 60% of the cases there could be a homogeneous adenoid cell mass because of the hemorrhage okay and in 20% of cases there could be a hyperechoic ring just hyperechoic ring that with typical ring of why there is ring of fire appearance some because uh, the because of increased Transferization. Because of the decidual reaction. Yeah, because of that. So, and in 30% of, 13% of cases, you can see a normal gestation sac with clear, beautiful cardiac activity or whatever it is, depending on the stage of gestation. Okay. But there could be a chance that you may not see anything in the uh, this thing also. So, how will you decide then? We'll check the beta HCG level at that time. Uh, it might be an early gestation. So, we are not able to see the ultrasound and we will follow up the beta HCG you know, if it's decreasing or it's an increasing trend. So what is the discriminatory zone of beta HCG? Oh. Hello. 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 Yes, Hello. Uh, Shay, am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So what is the discriminatory zone of beta HCG? Uh, Ma'am, uh, it is uh, there are two uh, uh, there are two school of thoughts. Uh, one is fifteen hundred and one is two thousand. Uh, below which uh, uh, that is generally taken as the discriminatory factor. Generally. Sorry, Doctor Shreya, I lost the connection. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So please uh, carry on. Yeah. What is the discriminatory zone? Uh, Ma'am, uh, there are two schools of thought. So one uh, says it's 1500 and uh, the other one says 2000 international. That is for? That is for? Uh, Ma'am, for ectopic pregnancy. Not for ectopic. See, it is like, see, by, uh, by the time the patient is having 1500 uh, million international of beta HCG in her body, a transvaginal ultrasound should reveal a gestational sac. Okay. So if there is no gestational sac, even, even if her HCG is more than 1500 by transvaginal ultrasound, that means the pregnancy is somewhere else, not in the uterus. Okay. So for transabdominal ultrasound, it depends on the uh, frequency of the transducer and all. Most commonly, it is somewhere around three to seven, three to six thousand. That is not fixed to a point, okay? But by transvaginal ultrasound, uh, you have to see a gestational sac in the uterine cavity by the time beta HCG reaches fifteen hundred. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, sorry, I lost the connection. Hello. Yes, ma'am. You're audible now. Yeah. Uh, where, where, uh, okay. So have you heard what I've said before? And, uh, via transvaginal ultrasound, we can see uh, in fact at 1500 to 1000 international. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So if a patient comes to you with a beta HCG less than 1500 international units, then it is hard to decide whether it is an intrauterine pregnancy or whether it is a ectopic pregnancy. So in that case scenario, what do you do? We'll wait. Uh, we'll ask the patient to come next week again for ultrasonography. In that time, we'll we want to wait for next week. What if she becomes hemodynamically unstable in between? What if they took raptures? Um, if we check the beta, if, if it's uh, less than 1000 uh, beta HCG level, then we generally go for weight and watch. No, never do that. If the beta HCG is below the discriminatory zone, whether uh, you will be, you can't expect a sac in uh, uterus. You can, I mean, like even if it is outside, also you can't see, I mean, you may not see all the time. So that is when you are in a doubtful situation, whether it is an ectopic or intra early intrauterine pregnancy. In that case scenario, you just repeat beta HCG after 48 hours and see what is the rise between the beta two beta HCG values. If the rise is good, how much does beta HCG rise in 48 hours? Okay. 
Hello, ma'am. Audible. Sorry, my connection is not very good. Hello. Yeah, yeah, you're audible, ma'am. Now. One second. I'll just connect with another internet. Ah, okay, ma'am. Hello, am I audible, Dr. Shreya? Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, sorry for the delay. Okay. So if the beta hCG is below discriminatory zone, then you are not very sure whether it is an int uh, uh, early intrauterine pregnancy or whether it is an ectopic pregnancy. In such case scenarios, you have to repeat the beta hCG after 48 hours. So what? how much raise do you expect in a normal intrauterine pregnancy? How much raise between the two values of beta hCG you expect? In 48 hours. Yes, it is around 66 to 68%. So if the raise is above that, that means the pregnancy is early intrauterine pregnancy and it is a normal or healthy pregnancy. So if the patient has come to you uh, with pain, abdomen or whatever it is, and if beta HCG, and if you don't see any uh, sac in the, this thing, and if beta HCG is less than the discriminatory zone, better to repeat it after 48 hours to make sure that the pregnancy is healthy. And if there is a, a decreased in, uh, raise in HCG levels, then you should be suspicious about HCG, I mean, ectopic pregnancy. Okay, and uh, by chance, if the repeat beta HCG is above 1500, even though the raise is not good, and if there is no uh, sac in the intrauterine cavity, then again, it confirms that it is ectopic. So always either there should be either the beta HCG, I mean, like, what are the confirmation confirmatory things for ectopic pregnancy are? The beta HCG should be above discriminatory zone and there should not be any sac in the preg, uh, uterus. If the beta HCG is less than the intra, I mean, discriminatory zone, then the raise should be good at least, at least 68% raise in 48 hours. If there is no good raise, then the risk of ectopic is always there. Okay. You understood? Yes, ma'am. So ma'am, we will never go for a wait and watch option. See, uh, if the patient is symptomatic, if the patient has come to you with pain abdomen, you have done a scan, and there is an and the beta HCG is below discriminatory zone. Do you want to wait for one more week? What if she uh, ruptures? You just recheck the beta HCG again after forty eight hours. If the raise is not good, then it is alarming, right? It means that she is having ectopic. Generally, this happens in infertility cases. I'll tell you why. So uh, we'll do embryo transfer. We'll ask them to come with beta HCG after uh, two weeks of embryo transfer. Their beta HCG levels will be very low. They'll be obviously will be less than the discriminatory zone. Okay. The risk of ectopic as such with infertility, I mean, with IVF cases is more. Why? Why? Because the risk of ectopic pregnancy in infertility, I mean, like in IVF is more. Why? The, sorry, risk of ectopic pregnancy in IVF is more. Why? And because uh, the, um, the embryo can get uh, uh, embedded in the fallopian tube as well. Infection. Yeah, because of the embryo transfer technique, there could be a chance that embryo can migrate into the uh, fallopian tubes. Also, as such, because of the infertility, the endometrium may not be very receptive. So embryo will implant it elsewhere. Okay. So always after doing uh, embryo transfer, you'll ask them for beta HCG, right? To confirm whether she's pregnant or not. And this beta HCG is in early pregnancy time. They'll always be less than discriminatory zone. So how will you decide whether the uh, pregnancy is good or not? If it is above the discriminatory zone, you do a scan and you can uh, find out a pregnancy and you can tell whether it is ectopic or not. But if it is less than that, you always have to repeat the beta HCG. Because they are under risk for ectopic and your beta HCG is very less. 
particularly if the patient is symptomatic if the patient is having pain or something like that it is always better to repeat beta hcg after 48 hours okay that is the best uh, thing you can do uh, if the beta hcg is below discriminatory zone okay yeah okay okay fine then so we have already uh, we have discussed uh, briefly about all the parts i think okay what else is remaining that's it yeah. do you have any doubts anybody has any doubts yeah what is the classical triad of uh, your ectopic pregnancy amenorrhea associated with abdominal pain with abnormal vaginal bleeding she some main complaints would be missed period with abdominal pain okay okay